welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you. It's good to be here, um, I think. <laughs> I hope that didn't come across disrespectful. I've been in contact with your husband, John, and he suggested that Dame Susie D is a nickname you had sort of recently acquired and quite liked it. Is that accurate? Oh, I wouldn't say I liked it, but I can't tell you why I got that, but that will all be revealed later in the year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, later in the year. Oh. Nice little tease. Um, that's exciting. So you're in Auckland. Uh, welcome to the ACC Studios. It's uh, early, so we're not going to have our traditional beers and perhaps wines, um, but what are you doing in Auckland? Uh, I'm just up here on a little project. Um, I'm on the board of Squash New Zealand, and uh, we have a national squash centre out on the Unitech campus. And it's, there's been a change of sort of management and someone let them down. So whenever there seems to be an issue with squash, it's sort of desperately seeking Susan. <laughs> and uh, I suppose because I've got the time and I'm available, then, um, you know, I've just come up to help for a couple of weeks. I spent a year virtually in Wellington last year salvaging a club that was the board had decided to uh, demolish um, called Club Kelburn. It's on the, in Kelburn Park right next to the University of Victoria. Um, and when news got out that it was going to be closed down and demolished, the locals there, squashies and the community sort of rang me and said, you know, this is a crap decision, basically. And um, and at that stage, there were a whole lot of issues with Squash New Zealand and people were approaching me. So it's easy to sit on the sidelines and criticise. So um, I put my hand up nearly two years ago and went on the board of Squash New Zealand. I didn't want to go on the board. Um, but uh, yeah, here I am, sort of doing my part and actually really delighted because if you look at the profile of Squash New Zealand currently with Paul Cole and Joelle King, um, we've got a real opportunity here to um, you know, put our game back on the map in New Zealand. Yeah, it is exciting times for squash and we're going to get into that a little bit later. I wanted to start, you're waiting out in the, um, the foyer there and you know, someone came and told me Dame Susan's here and I was like, yeah, Dame Susan, I, I'll address her as Dame Susan and then I kind of bottled it and I said, oh, hello Susan, but I was wondering about the whole, if you're a sir, you've got a lady, right? If you're a dame, like, what is John to you? Um, Gentleman John, wouldn't it? Gentleman John? No, no, our friends call him Lady John, but he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't see the funny side. Uh, you know, he's been called Mr. Devoy over the years. He's been called everything. Um, I don't think it's never worried him or he's never never seemed to worry him. But it is slightly unusual, isn't it? That um, It's not only that. I suppose it's... I don't obviously expect or want to be called Dame uh, Susan, but uh, it's interesting over the years I've been to lots of places where I've been with you know, Sir Richard Hadley or Sir Murray Helberg or Sir Edmund Hillary and people always call um, men by their titles uh, and I've always just been Susan, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's an unusual, uh, you know, very few people, unless there's a formal occasion or they want something, call me Dame Susan, I can assure you. Yeah. Do you ever get people curtsying? Uh, no, no, I'm not, not that high up. Ne the but never ever, like it's not even no. if you're in the UK, people. <laughs> no. Okay. No. I'm just I'm unsure of my p's and q's on yeah. on yeah, knights no, of the British no. Empire. In fact, I can tell you a funny story. Um, a few years ago, when I was at the commission, um, at the Human Rights Commission, I was uh, running to catch a plane, and of course, all of my bookings through Air New Zealand had Dame Susan Devoy. I couldn't get a ticket through the kiosk that said, "Please go to the check-in counter." And I went there, and there was a very young. Um, I think Kiwi Indian girl and uh, she was very nice and she said could I have some identification and so I gave her my passport and she said what does damn mean <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I said oh it's uh, I thought you know I'm not going to sound like a pompous twat here and say <laughs> no. I said oh look it's my nickname well she gave me a right raw bollocking about using my nickname on you a can't. formal um, thing and then I was to never do it again and I was very lucky that I was able to catch the flight oh boy wow so actually I should have told her that I was Dame Susan Devoy <laughs> <laughs> she, she should know her titular titles and, uh, and upgrade me but yeah you were made a dame at 34 which is sort of half a lifetime ago almost um, when, you, when I think back you know, half a lifetime ago, I think, oh, geez, that, that person didn't know anything. Do you think of that when, when you were 34 and, and given this great honour? Like, I didn't really know much about anything um, at that age. No, I think it, it, you know, it came as a bit of a bolt out of the blue. I actually remember coming home from the hospital. I just had my fourth son, <laughs> um, and there was a pile of mail there. We had snail mail in those days. And there was a letter there from the 
Queen's representative or the Governor General, whoever does, I don't know, asking, saying that I had been nominated for this honour for Queen's birthday. And I mean, it is a bit like a party RSVPs thing. You've got to tick the right box, you know. Yeah. My husband, knowing how hormonal I was, well, make sure you tick the bloody right box. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I suppose it's different life for sports people in some ways because the first part of our lives are so packed. You know, what we do is, you know, condensed with this period of time. I mean, in my sport, you know, I was 29 when I retired, probably relatively quite young, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, th I would like to hope and think that it was not just for my squash um, uh, achievements, that it was for the other things that, you know, I'd done in my life to then. But, yeah, it's a huge honour. It's a, um, you know, it's an unusual thing to have when you're quite young um, and people look at you a little weirdly. But it certainly doesn't have any uh, pro, uh, perks to the job, I can promise you. No no, no sword? No, 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 no car park somewhere? No. Yeah. In fact, the day after it was announced at Queen's birthday, I was pushing my wheelie bin up the driveway. We lived in Auckland then. A couple of women walked past and said, oh, that's no job for a dame. I said, no, but the chauffeur and the butler have got the day off today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. Do you get like a, like a signed certificate or anything that gets framed? Oh, when you or? get... Um, uh, knighted or whatever you call it, donged or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it is knighted, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a, you know, a lovely, uh, well, you get a medal, um, which my children had theirs, mine in the play box. Um, that's, that's like gold medal, like Olympic winners as well. Where's your medal? Oh, it's in a drawer somewhere. Is yeah. it the same yeah, for yeah. your... Yeah, I don't have any trophies. I don't have anything. If you came to my house, you wouldn't find anything. There might be a couple of old things in a box in my garage or whatever, but I donated all my trophies to the uh, Sports Hall of Fame in Dunedin. Um, not that I thought that, you know, the whole world should see them, but they were better than, you know, cluttering around at home. Yeah. You won't find a shrine to wow. game <laughs> Susan in our house. It hasn't been lost on me that I just compared my half-life to Dame Susan DeVoy's yeah. either, you know. <laughs> it's it's, and also 34 is only three years ago for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, that old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, the way we do things between two beers, we tell the audience how we know the guests. So Shay, how do you know Dame Susan DeVoy? Uh, 90s child. So growing up, um, consuming sport back then was either through 6pm One News Sports Bulletin or Sunday's Countrywide Bank Grandstand. And... Your exploits were quite often on my TV screen growing up. Um, people like Erin Baker as well. Um, every four years we'd have a Commonwealth Games, every four years we'd have an Olympic Games. So you were quite a constant presence in terms of a, of a, a sporting legend um, as I grew up. So it's amazing to kind of share some, some time and to actually meet you in person now all these years ago, but to think you've also had a second life post-career, which I'm really interested in, in finding out a little bit more about a little bit later on. but. My connection's probably a little bit more personal than Stephen's connection because he's a little bit younger than me. If you said he was old, then I don't know what you think that makes <laughs> me. But Stevie, your connection to Dame Susan, yeah, Susie D? Well, I grew up in a squash family. My mum and dad would play squash two or three times a week. So I spent a lot of time at the Hamilton Squash Club um, and know that sort of scene so quite well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So mum, mum was very excited when she heard that we were getting you on as a guest. But I've heard you talk about some of the battles you had with your husband John playing squash, and it made me think of my mum and dad. You know, dad would always beat mum, but on occasion she'd get up, she might take a set or a game, and she'd just be glowing, and I could tell it meant the world to her. And it made me think, like, what were your battles like? Were you guys evenly matched? Uh, we were evenly matched, actually, and probably, you know, I was. Uh I won my first British Open in 84, John came to the UK in 85 and we would train together and even in training it was a bit vicious, well I was a bit vicious, yeah. he wasn't <laughs> and I remember one very early on in our relationship where you know he'd given up everything and come over to the UK and you know I, I was sort of, I, I mean I'm very competitive of course and it erupted into a bit of a fight and I remember he just sort of dropped his rag and said, right, I'm out of here. I, I, I can't handle this anymore. I'm off back to New Zealand. I was oh, no, no, no. I promise I won't be like that again. I'll play with my bad hand. Yeah. But, um, I used to play in the men's tournaments in New Zealand to get, you know, better competition. Um, and we had, we came up against each other a couple of times and there was one horrendous battle in the North Island Champs in Palmerston North. And I won, the scoring's a bit different today, but I won like, you know, by his breath, I won 10 on in the fifth, and it was like, you know, to the, to the end, absolutely, and it was just hilarious, because most of the times he actually did beat me, but on this occasion I did, and the television were there, so it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's intense. That's yeah. so good. Because he was, he was your coach? 
No, no, he was. Um, he became my manager. Manager. A coach called Bryce Taylor in the UK, but um, I mean Bryce didn't travel with me all the time, so I suppose John was a default coach. Yeah. Um, but he was also my manager and my training partner. But you know, he wasn't the greatest coach in the world because, you know, when you play squash and you've got these glass backs and you look out and there's your support crew. Bryce would always be nonchalant, you know, his man, his facial expressions would never change. Not that you should be looking out of the court anyway, uh, but John would always, if it wasn't going well, be slumped right down <laughs> in the chair, sort of, you know, with his brow far. And I think, oh, that looks, that's really supportive. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. But, yeah, we had a long, uh, a long successful uh on and off court relationship, you might say. What was your way when he packed it in and wanted to go home to get under his skin? Was it a little verbal sledge or were, yeah. what were you doing that annoyed uh, him? Just beating him. Oh, just arguing, I suppose, about decisions. You know, I mean, I would say it was out and he'd say it was in and I'd say it was a double bounce and he'd say it wasn't. And I mean, it's just yeah. competitive banter, really. Um, yeah. You know, we've probably been like that in anything we've done in our life, yeah. including having children. Yeah. <laughs> um, when was the last time you played against John? Oh, million years ago I mean the reality is that you know if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me if I still played squash and I'm 58 years of age well I'd be well and truly retired yeah. um, uh, and living the life of luxury it's weird isn't it that people think and look at you and think I mean even at the National Squash Centre people say to me do you still play and I'm like uh, no yeah. if I can possibly avoid it uh, but then I get on the court like I have done in the last couple of weeks just socially with people who are you know I was going to say choppers, but <laughs> very rude of me, isn't it? Um, and I can hit the ball okay, but I'm, you know, I look very good stationary. But the minute I start to run, it's just because um, I haven't done it for so long. I just my brain says yes, but my body says no, you know. So um, yeah, I, I've hardly I've hardly played in since 1992 when I retired. Yeah, wow. Um, so. The way we kind of do things is we try to canvas as many of your friends or family or colleagues to get some sort of oh insight. Oh, there's a bit of background to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, there is. And can I just say, the Devoy and the Oakley family have really come to the party. Uh, They've dropped us a few sort of inside lines that we'd like to explore. And I'm not really sure. I don't sure. know if I'd known this part of the show. <laughs> yeah. I would have been actually quite yeah. so willing so to. So we trick uh, you in here. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. And we uh, but at least I get the last say, don't I? Yes, yes you do. it's your episode. Yeah. So yes, you can exactly. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Julian, uh, your son, who's a, a very talented runner, which we'll get to in a little bit, has suggested we start by talking about a recent family trip to Queenstown. And he said, you might have had a particularly good night at the Blue Door. Now, I've got a few more details, but what do you remember about that night? Uh, I remember the huge bar tab <laughs> at the end of the night, which mum and dad paid for. So it's very rich of them to nice. actually dob me in on this occasion. <laughs> and they will never be taken away on holiday again, I well, can promise you. S sorry, uh, sorry about sorry that, Julian. <laughs> yeah. I remember being socially excited and not eating very much. That's what I can attribute to getting mm. slightly tipsy. And I can just remember perhaps interrupting the guy singing on stage. The band, and yeah. And perhaps... <laughs> getting overzealous with my dancing, thinking I was going to be asked to go on Dancing with the Stars. Wow, oh, how good wow. would that be? Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, apart from that, it's a little blurry. Okay. It was everyone, actually, I wasn't the only one, apart from Julian, who never really... Cuts you know, loose. Cuts loose. Uh, he's an anomaly in our family. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was, a, it was a really nice... It was actually a really good evening. You know, not every parent takes their adult children and their partners to Queenstown for Easter and stays at Millbrook and then stays at Queenstown so yeah. that is really nice yeah very nice his, uh, for the record his retelling went um, said <laughs> she got trashed on espresso martinis and was having a great time dancing around with the band and a guy recognised her and was sending pictures back to his mates who were all squash players and had a group chat called Yes Devoy instead of Yes Boy uh, did I you know that? Did you <laughs> <laughs> didn't know that someone no, was taking little videos what, of you. No, and I tell you what—that's why I am so grateful that when I was playing I bet. and doing stuff, there was not that I w was very often very. I mean, I'm pretty w badly behaved now as a <laughs> grown-up since I was over 33 or whatever. But um, you know, I hardly touched alcohol until I was 30. Spent the next 30 years catching up for it. Not that it's anything to be proud of, I must say. But, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I did I celebrate it on occasions, but I would only take a couple of glasses and I'd be, you know, out of it. But 
I'm so grateful there was none of this social media stuff that, you know, I mean, God, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. I feel sorry for sports. But I feel sorry for anybody in public life these days because you can't even be yourself, can you? Mm. Well, does that, is that, does that still happen now that you get squash people coming up to you even so long after your career ended and oh, not, interacting? Not, uh, squash people, yes, who know me, yes, they would do that. But generally, um, you know, I'm recognisable to a generation. I mean, it's very kind of you to say you remember me in the 90s, but... Um, you know, most I'm recognised by a certain generation, you know, and um, younger people or whatever have no idea, and that's, you know, why should they? Perfectly mm. understandable, which is great because I can sort of, not that I've ever stopped being myself, but I don't necessarily have to worry so much. Um, I had to worry a lot, of course, when I was race relations commissioner. You have to be very, mm. uh, very well behaved. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's. Um, oh look. As so long as it's not illegal, unethical, or immoral, I mean, what's what's the problem? Just sounded like a son saying that his mum had a great night out to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I love that the only way that she gets exposed is by coming on a podcast and it getting brought up. You <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Outside yeah. of that squash, yeah. outside of that yes to boy group, no one yeah. else would have known. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us about your boys. So this is really cool. I, I messaged John, uh, your husband, and and sort of said you know what, what's some good things to talk about and he wrote back little bios about all the kids and said she's so proud of her boys um and they've all sound like they're at a really cool age and they're all doing really well for themselves so julian is the elite runner alex is a qualified mechanical engineer josh is the wild one graduated from media school in new york and jamie is an architect who won multiple new zealand squash titles before leaving new zealand to study in the u.s so three of the four went to the US through the US college system, right? Was that by design that you wanted them to sort of explore and see the world? No, it was sort of by accident, really. Um, firstly, Julian got scouted, and uh, he, you know, he's a runner, and he got scouted in his last year of school, I think, um, to go to college on a track and field scholarship, and at Providence College, and that was sort of. Um, what they call a full ride, mm. which means it's all paid for. So you know, you weren't on that, were you? I was. Yeah, were you? I, I went. Uh, I wasn't the first year, but then I became a full ride. Yeah. Sorry. And what did you go for? Uh, soccer scholarship, oh, Monmouth right. University. Yeah. yeah. So he went um, reluctantly. Actually, he didn't want to go, and I, I remember dragging him, kicking and screaming, and you know, we went to New York and mm. put him up there, like you know, taking a three-year-old to his. I'll get this back, Aunt Julian. <laughs> taking like a three-year-old to his first day at you know. Um, early childhood or whatever um, but yeah he absolutely loved it and then my my brother was a coach at a uh, college in the States in Cornell and my nephew is a coach in, in the States so my the two youngest Josh and Jamie went and played in the US and Canadian Opens at the end of sort of December and you know they were both relatively good and um, you know they sort of got interested and got options to go study over there too but squash scholarships are nothing like a track and field so um, it's cost the bank of mum and dad a lot of money I can assure you I'm not sure we've got a return on investment yet yeah. uh, but we're working on it but yeah great experience for them and um, particularly for squash players because both Josh and Jamie may have gone to university here and they probably would never have continued their squash um, they may have got a degree but over there they got both and just the most amazing experience because whilst it's an individual sport it's played in a team environment in the States and so you know I think it's you know I, I think personally I'm starting to see the benefit for them of having that experience um, you know our other son Alex didn't go and people always sort of look at us as a family and say oh why didn't Alex want to go or you know well if Alex had wanted to go we would have made that happen too you know but it wasn't what he wanted to do so yeah I mean they've been I mean I just think as a parent that's our job really providing the setting them on their way you know providing them with the best opportunity and um, investing in them now because I'll tell you what there's not going to be much left by the time we go because we're <laughs> on our way to spending it all right now yeah. <laughs> if Queenstown's anything to go by yeah well that's so, them they're, like they're out of the loop now it's John and I <laughs> did um did any of any part of you I know a parent wants their best for their kids regardless of what they choose but did any part of you want them to follow in the squash professional squash footsteps um, to be honest, yeah, I thought our youngest had um, 
has has because he's only 24 mm. uh, the potential to be you know really good in fact Josh is really good too but uh, Jamie had sort of that X factor on the court but you know if you could package up all the good things of your children and put them in one little person we mm. would have had the perfect person I mean Julian's work ethic, work ethic, work ethic is just phenomenal uh, he probably just doesn't have the confidence or the mongrel of the other two they had all of that and Jamie had all the talent but they were just legends in their own lunch time you know is, is, um, is that why you ran a, a four under five operation uh, no <laughs> I ran a four under five operation because I started late well late 29 that's really late isn't it uh, and John and I wanted a large family um, and I've got six brothers and no sisters and I wouldn't have minded to have had a daughter I've got six brothers and no sisters now I've got four sons and no daughters so I've been well and truly punished for all the terrible things I've said about men in my <laughs> life uh, but after four boys well you know I mean who would why would you well why I've been uh, Stephen's running a three was running a three under five now Ooh. his eldest is six Ooh. and I've been round there and I refuse to go back to the house now because it's that's a lot to take in. You've put one more on top of that, Steve. Can you speak from experience as yeah, to? Yeah, I, I want to talk about that period of your life because you <coughs> you've known up until then you've just been a sort of professional squash player, and you come home and then you have this family. Four under five is a lot. Like that is ca I can't imagine putting another little munter in the mix <laughs> in our house. Um, Not to say that your three are currently. Oh, you're they're three chaos. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, kids. beautiful kids, but they're chaos. Um, but take me back to that like was that just overwhelming did you have support like wh wh how do you reflect on that period of your life um it's sort of a distant memory you know like um you wonder sometimes how you did do it uh and no I didn't have any help I didn't have family that lived close by um you know my children were the sort of 16th 17th 18th 19th 20th or whatever grandchildren my mother was well and truly over and getting older, you know. Um, so, yeah. You know, I'd grown up in a family of males in a very busy, boisterous, perhaps our age, you know, we weren't as close as all that, but I didn't really think it was all that, I thought that was quite normal. You know, mess, noise, busy. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was just, just what it is. I mean, that's what we wanted and that's what we got. Yeah. And I want to sort of move that on to a, another yarn that's been passed on to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been prompted to ask about your family trip to Europe in 2007. So working out the math, I think that the boys would have all been teenagers then. And Julian has suggested that you shaved your head because you were so sick of them. Do you remember this? No. Shaved my head. I've, I can attest that I've done this on a, a sports trip. I was a team manager of a, a group of men to Samoa and I just got so frustrated one day that I just said George Akers get the clippers oh shaved their head I thought you meant shaved my well, head it's yeah no 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 yes no that was yeah uh, I lost yeah. in translation yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah, you yeah, shaved yeah, their yeah, heads yeah I thought oh I shaved my head well, I mean, <laughs> that's I, what I thought I'm never we going to let them uh, get the better of me I tell you what my mother used to always say um, you know children can be uh, on the board but no one's going to be the chairman um, <laughs> that's a good one you know um, yeah no 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 I did yeah yeah, gave them all a Skinner haircut just to, uh, you know, perhaps remind them of who was actually in charge. Yeah, I mean, we took our children away in, yeah, it was 2007. Julian was 13. So there you go, count back. 9, 11, 9, 11, 12, 13 they were, yeah, and we went away to Europe for four or five months with another family of all girls, actually, um, from Tauranga, and... Uh, John came for a month, he had to work, and the rest of us went, yeah, it was amazing. We had a month in Europe, uh, a month in France, a month in Spain, a month in Italy, and then we had two weeks in the UK on the way there and two weeks in Thailand on the way home. And, um, yeah, I mean, parts of it were fantastic and parts were really awful, I can assure you, but I just always remember the look on these young girls, little girls' faces when they saw what our boys did, you know, spraying tampons with links and <laughs> tying them to hotel pool fences and lighting them and... <laughs> You know, beating the living crap out of each other, and these girls would be sitting on the couch in tears. You know, yeah. is that what people do to each other? Yeah. And yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, when we when you look at what we've done as a family, God, we're so blessed, aren't we, that we've been able to do that, and um, 
and it sounds like my children sort of appreciate it by the sounds of things or they least remember it I suppose that's something yeah it must be really cool having them at those different age groups you, you think back to that time when they're sort of rambunctious you know mischief creating teenagers and then where they are now like at a cool sort of mid-twenties age where they're finding themselves it's cool to catch up for a drink and reflect on what's gone in their life they bloody live at home yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not like we're catching up for a drink. No shame in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no yeah. shame in that. Well, post uh, yeah, post COVID, after the first, we had two sons living in Melbourne and two sons living in America. So you know, we thought the chances of our family being together were pretty remote. Mm. And then suddenly we had, you know, four living at home and uh, and two partners. Oh wow! And uh, in a smallish, you know, compared to what we used to have when we were when the kids were little. Um, of course, they've gone flatting or something. Julian's still at home. Jamie's come back from the states and whatever. So it's um, yeah, it, it's 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 different. But yeah, I, I mean, I feel I, you know, given the times that we're going through, I feel very I feel a little sad for young people, you know, of their stage and age. I mean, yes, they're doing okay and it's all, but this is probably not where they choose to be. And COVID has, you know, some of them haven't done their OE. Um, well, they tell me they haven't had the, done their OE, but they lived in America for four years, you know, courtesy of mum and dad. So, yeah, it's yeah. not all bad. But, um, yeah, it's just challenging times. Okay. Just, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say I want to thank you because I think you've given Stephen just that little glimmer of hope that while he's in the depths of chaos right now, it might all pay off in the end with his kids telling some great stories about them growing up in about 10 10 years time when you take them all on a holiday to Europe maybe yeah nice nice words Shay. yeah you'll get there mate just hang in there <laughs> <laughs> okay just to close the loop on this one more um, tell us about the time you got hustled out of 200 euros oh. in a shell game oh. in Barcelona <laughs> jeez gosh it's all coming out now isn't it yeah um, we guess so we're not sure let's see what happens yeah yeah well it's a hustle game. Is it like a game of craps, isn't it? You know those people on the side of the street that think they can fool you mm. with the little thing under the little mm. whatever's, the peanut or whatever yes. it is. Mm. Thing. Well, I watched it for a long, long time, and I thought, I can do that. And, of course, you know, I'm a bit compulsive on most things, so I, you know, lost my 10 euro the first, and then <laughs> I lost my next 10 euro, and then we doubled it, but I knew I'd finally get it in 200 euro. It wasn't 200 euro. It might have been 100 <laughs> Later, it was all gone. Yeah, yeah. That, that competitive instinct of yours <laughs> bubbling over as well. Yeah, or stupidity, actually. <laughs> I should know that gamblers never win. Is that one of those stories that just keeps they keep yeah. nudging you? Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. nothing to you, but they're yeah. just like, oh, remember that you know, shell I game? I tell month? a whole lot of stories about remember them that. that 500 that I euro bring you up. lost over yeah. in Spain, Mum? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the amount keeps yeah. rising. It would never after have happened if John had been there. He's just too conservative. So that, you know, I was making the most of my free spirit. Okay, let's get into the, the meat of it. Um, I love talking to athletes who have risen to the very top in their field and become the best in the world um, to try to understand you know, how they're different, uh, what makes them tick. And on researching you, uh, there was one story that really jumped out to me. And I was like, okay, all right, there it is. That's, that's the difference. I this is true, as opposed to all the others. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> maybe, maybe it is. Um, so I heard you talk about being 11 running five kilometers to training and then running five kilometers home now i don't know any 11 year old that would consider doing something like that but was that was that normal for you i never let the truth get in the way of a good story <laughs> that's slightly embellished okay but um it was probably three kilometers okay uh, swedish might, rounding so we go and up and it might have been 10 <laughs> yeah no but i used to run from where i lived in rotorua to the geyser city squash club which was about three k's down the road very early in the morning before school and i'd practice on my own and then i would always run home but i would always stop at the bakery that was just <laughs> opening on the way and buy myself either a raspberry don a raspberry donut a raspberry bun or a chocolate clear <laughs> um and then i'd run home again that was my treat for training. But yeah. I did that for years. and I did that until I became old enough and wise enough to know that you could, that you could wag school yeah. and that you could go to the squash courts during the day when, yeah. you know, and spend longer. So that's what I did. But, yeah, I mean... Um, but when you think of that now... Like well, whether it wouldn't it be safe enough, would it? <laughs> yeah. You run to school. You'd probably get shot if you were in Auckland. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's say you were 10 and it was only, three, only 3K... Like, you don't know kids that would do that. I know you, we're saying you can't do it, but, like, that mental strength or, or that desire, like, what was it that, 
that made you like that? Um, well, there was no other way I was going to get to the squash club, um, <laughs> apart from getting there on my own, own two feet. Um, yeah, I, I just think there was something in me that was just driven to be better a little bit every day. And as I said, compulsion or obsession, I don't know, whichever you'd call it, um, that training was the only way that I was going to get to where I wanted to be. And, you know, it was always longer, harder, better. But I loved it. You know, that at the end of the day, I loved training as much as I loved competing. So for me, it was never... You know, and I look at Julian now. He works 50 hours a week, you know, at Craig's Investments, and he gets up earlier and earlier and earlier to run. You know, like, I hear his alarm go off, and he's up at 6 o'clock running and, and, you know, not just jogging around the, you know, around the park. And then he comes home from work at 6 o'clock, and he's out running again. And, you know, I, I admire that because that's exactly what I was like. You know, whatever it takes, what do you have to do each day if you want to, you know, achieve your goal? And w was that self-motivated or did you have people encouraging you to do that or is it just... No, completely self-motivated. My parents were lounge lizards, you know. I mean, and most of my brothers were incredibly talented at sport, but they were, you know, they liked the social side of, of squashes more than probably the competitive side. But... Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, I think if as a parent, if you have to, I mean, you can encourage your children and sometimes you have to kick them up the what's it, but basically if you're hounding your children to get up and do something or train or put in extra effort or do whatever, then, you know, they're not going to want, they're not, they're not driven to do it themselves. They're not self-motivated. And, you know, in fact, I was probably the opposite. I had to be told not to do so much. You know, I overtrained. Mm. And that was sort of the lessons I learned as I went overseas and got older that, you know, we had to train smarter, not harder. Um, but we didn't have the technology then, or the, you know, all the things. It was sort of hit and miss, really, in my day, wasn't it? You know, I mean, if someone was doing, you know, Jeff Hunt was the men's world champion before Jahanga, and he was doing 4,400 metres, so I thought, oh, God, I better do that, because, you know, that'll make me really good. Or, you know, we didn't have sports scientists, we didn't have psychologists, you know, we just learnt as we went along, really. Well, one of our favourite guests to reference, we had a guy called Tim Wigmore who wrote a book about what it takes to create elite athletes. And two of the major things he spoke about would be in a younger sibling and coming from a smaller town. So how much of the youngest of six do you think played a, a role in your success, the competitiveness of trying to keep up with your siblings? Um, well, I'm five years younger than my next brother. And so when I was born, my oldest brother was 20 so there's a large spread between all of us. But if you, you know, if you think of being born into a sporting family, while not, whilst not necessarily a, you know, New Zealand representative family, although my brothers represented New Zealand for squash, but, um, you know, our days were just filled with cricket, rugby, football, you know, anything and everything, mostly the traditional sports, tennis. And then, you know, we sort of by default fell into squash, you know, one of my brothers was, I think, you know, at Silverstream Uni uh, College in Wellington and they went, took him to the squash and came back to Rotorua when the new centre had opened and said, oh, we should go and try this. So that's sort of how we started. But, you know, my brothers wouldn't let me play cricket until I could learn to bowl straight. So, you know, they'd put <laughs> a big X on something and then when I could learn to hit that, I'd be able to, or I wasn't allowed to play in the backyard until I could spiral pass or, you know, I wasn't allowed to do this until I could climb to the tree and carve my name into the top. And, you know, so it was all of this sort of, you know, just accidents, sort of, this is what you have to do if you want to actually compete and play with us and whatever. So, yeah, and aside from that, it was a lot of rough and tumble, you know. I mean, it wasn't a it wasn't a gentle childhood, if you know what I mean, but I wasn't a sort of uh, prissy young female either. So, yeah, so it was just, I mean, you have to be a product of your environment, don't you, in some shape or form. And, I, you know, it was certainly um, keep up or get left behind, really. Do you remember your first squash tournament in Rotorua? Do you remember the score of your first game? I think that was in Hamilton, actually. Hamilton, okay. Nine love, nine love, nine love. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I relayed that story at a funeral last week of a gentleman called Murray Day, who was the 
World Squash president in the 70s, and I had to write to Mr Day to get permission to go and play in the Hamilton Squash Club because children under 10 weren't allowed in the building. Oh, yeah, wow. So you were nine? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I was, uh, I lost Nine Love, Nine Love, Nine Love. And I How old was your opponent? She was, I think she might have been 11 or 12 because it was under 13. She was much bigger and stronger. In fact, it was Raywin Bradburn, Grant Bradburn's sister, oh. who I sometimes see in Tauranga occasionally. Um, but yeah, when I came off the court, I burst into tears because, you know, I had great aspirations of being, I thought I was much better than I was. And uh, my father was giving me a bollocking for being such a bad sport. And um, she was on the other side of the bench getting a bollocking from her father for being so mean. So she was crying too. So I was like, wow. Do you joke about that now? <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. We laugh when we see each other. And uh, yeah, so it was probably, uh, I, I, I'm pleased to say I went on to better. Great <laughs> you did. Yeah, you did quite well. Did right. any part of you at that point go, um, this isn't for me? Like a, such a big disappointment so early. Um, no, not really, because, you know, I was sort of so excited. I mean, I wasn't out of the tournament, so I went on to play some other games I can't remember. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, well, I, it's, it's, it's only 50 years ago, you know, <laughs> so I am struggling to remember. But, yeah, no, no, I think I might have been all right. I think I probably picked the socks up and carried on. So 17-year-old Susan DeVoy has got quite good at squash at this point and decided that school is not really for you anymore, but you don't tell your dad. What, talk, talk, us about that, talk to us about that year. Uh, I went to an all-girls Catholic school in Rotorua, MacKillop College, and it wasn't the greatest sporting school um, uh, in town. And, you know, in those days, if you played a non-traditional sport or a minority sport like squash or an individual sport, there was nothing really in it for you, but... I remember coming back one weekend from a squash tournament and one of the nuns, Sister Imelda, had asked me if I had completed my assignment and I said uh, no. I had been away at a all weekend at a squash tournament and she said, are you more interested in playing squash or being at school? And I thought, that's a silly question. And picked, got my de books out of my desk, put them in my bag and left. And... Um, I was a bit scared to tell my parents, so for three weeks I used to get dressed in my school uniform and hide under the house until they'd gone to work. <laughs> they both worked together in town. Um, and is that, I've heard you say that. Is that a turn of phrase? Like, did you literally hide <laughs> under yeah. the house? Yeah, I literally hid under the house, yeah. Was that the best play? You couldn't have just Yeah, well, we just had an something? open under the house, and I just used to sneak in there, and then I could see, you know, strategically positioned, I could see the car go out of the driveway and they'd gone to work, and then... Um, uh, but I got sprung, and then I'd go to the courts for most of the day, you see. Uh, and I got sprung because it was my job at home to empty the ashes out of the fireplace, you know, and every night wrap them in newspaper and put them in the brown paper bags. Well, if you do that after school, the ashes are generally cold, but if you do them first thing in the morning, <laughs> 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 the brown rubbish bag catches fire and so does the house. Oh, no. So oh, that's, how I, that's how I got sprung, actually. Wow. Um, and then my parents were bitterly disappointed because... You know, I was the only daughter after six sons, and I think my father had also really supportive of my squash. They really wanted me to go to university or, or you know, have a job or a career or something. So um, my father said, you've, well, that's fine if you want to play squash, but you've got to find yourself a job. And so I got a job as a builder's labourer on a, on a building site that actually built the Sheraton uh, Hotel, which I think is now the distinction or something. Uh, so I went from, you know, to another all-male environment, but, um, you know... You were the only female on site? Yeah, 50 blokes. I made the cups of tea and got the smoko. I'm noticing a bit of a pattern here, yeah, Susan. The, yeah, and then <laughs> did, a, did an awful lot of painting, actually. Um, did you go to the same baker and get the raspberry buns <laughs> or the chocolate <laughs> no. eclairs? <laughs> no, no, that, that had closed down by then. But, um, but that was enough to, you know, earn enough money to get a, uh, get a flight to, to Europe. Uh, to the UK. C can I pause there for a second and just ask a question around you've got this goal of being the world's best squash player at, at 17. There isn't a blueprint or anything like that to follow, is there? Have you just gone the place, is, was the place to, to be the UK? Was that just the, yeah. the mecca of squash? I think what happened squash? was I'd been, in that year I got oh, the next year actually, I went on my first um First big trip, you know, I went to Canada for the world champs. I played in the junior world champs. I think 
I got third, <laughs> I can't even remember. Uh, and then following the juniors was the women's seniors, and that was, you know, that was a real taste for me to decide that that's where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And whilst there wasn't necessarily a blueprint, there were plenty, plenty of really good Aussies to look up to. I mean, they, in those days, they were the, you know, the people we aspired to be like. Um, so yeah, and the main, you know, squash in those days was dominated and played mostly in the UK and it was mostly a southern hemisphere sport basically. Um, so that was the place where everyone went and of course the ultimate for us squashies was the British Open. It, it might be a hard question to answer because um, obviously times were different, but how do you think you would have reacted if one of your sons had said they were dropping out of school at 17 to pursue a dream of a kind of a niche sport that you'd never really heard anyone being successful at? Uh, I would have said go for it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you're a long time retired uh, and, you know, if you have a talent and you have... I mean, it would depend on how much effort they'd actually shown or put into it, you know, I mean... Um, you know, the expectations of for us when our sons went to college, not Julian, but the other two to play squash, was, you know, you're going to give this you know, 100%, you're not just going there as, you know, to fill up the numbers or because you've got an opportunity to go to America. Um, so, yeah, there's a level of expectation, but certainly I think, uh, and particularly here in New Zealand, I mean, if you're involved in a sport, a minority sport, or, you know, outside of the, the big ones or an Olympic sport or a Commonwealth Games sport, I mean, you really do need a lot of support to actually go and uh, be able to sort of fulfil that dream or... At the very least, I think people have, should be given the opportunity to see, to discover their potential, to see how far they can possibly go. And look, if you make it, that's a bonus. If you don't, then I think the experience and what you learn in life is so much more valuable than not having given it a chance. So you say support is important. You went at 17 to the UK by yourself, right? Like, what exactly did that mean? What did that look like? Who did you stay with? How did you get around? Like... Ah, oh, well, I mean, I must have been incredibly naive, as probably my parents were too. I mean, I thought that going from uh, Auckland to Heathrow was a bit like going from Rotorua to Auckland on the bus, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, it was a real eye-opener because in the first year that I was there, it's you sort of, I don't know, couch surf from place to place. Uh, uh, in some tournaments, the big tournaments, they might put you up in a hotel for the first night, but the minute you lose, you're out. And I think I lost virtually every first round for the entire season. Um, and are those tournaments all in the UK? Oh, and not all over Europe. Wow. Yeah, so you might play a number of tournaments in the UK or Scotland or Ireland, but you've got the French Open, the German Open, the Dutch Open, and the Finnish Open and all that. So it was sort of, you know, a, a circuit. And you'd, um, you know, either, if you're billeted, you, you know, the family would be, kind enough to let you stay for a few days and then you had to sort of find this period of time between the next tournament where you were going to stay I stayed with one of who became my you know greatest rivals Lisa Ropey for a while in Nottingham and um, that wasn't necessarily always going to pan out the best way so you know I sort of stayed with the people she stayed with for a little bit but um, yeah it was it's it was pretty horrendous actually and um, uh at the end of that first season, I played in my first British Open, and uh, I don't know if I, I think it was qualifying then, so you didn't even get into the first round, and there was um, a guy called Bryce Taylor who became my coach, and his partner Marie, uh, and they were Kiwis, they'd gone to the UK to coach Bruce Brownlee, and then Bruce Brownlee had got um, really badly injured, he had hip, hip problems. Uh, anyway, Marie had gone up to Bryce and said, you want to go and watch that Devoy girl play on such and such court? She's, she's pretty good. And so we got chatting with them, and Stu Davenport, another New Zealand player, had been staying with them. And so they offered me, when I came back, because I was heading back to New Zealand, if I came back, they said that they could, I could have a bed at their place, um, which was actually a couch at their place. Uh, and that, I think, was pivotal in me... I, I'm not actually sure whether if I hadn't found a base mm. and a coach in some sort of stable environment, whether, you know, 
I don't think I would have been able to do it on my own. But that first year, you've lost in the first round at all the games. Was there a part of you? Do you remember thinking maybe this isn't for me? Was there any part that thought about packing it in? Um, yeah, lots, lots. But it was really common theme in those days that lots of Kiwis would go over for that first year, and none of them would ever go back. Mm. You know, which meant it was incredibly hard. People didn't realise, I don't think, how hard it was. Um, and so, yeah, there was, and I think that meeting of Bryce and Marie and knowing that I had somewhere to go to next time was going to be, um, you know, a game changer. And, uh, you know, it's, it certainly was. I mean, I think in some ways it was probably good for me because I went over there pretty, pretty cocky. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I thought I was pretty good in the scheme of things. So, um, <laughs> You know, it was a good eye-opener, really. I guess if you've beaten everyone in yeah. New Zealand around your level, why wouldn't you be? You, you don't really know what Yeah, I mean, I thought I, was, I thought I was going to be world champion by the end of the season. I don't know what took me so long. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to, to contextualise it as well, it's, for some of our listeners, they wouldn't have any idea that back then as well, you don't have access to sport psychologists like some athletes do now. You don't have a mobile device that you can send a message to your family or have a video call with your family back home. We're talking writing letters. We're talking making calls from public telephones, I could have probably imagined. Yeah. yeah, no, it was awful. I mean, you had to really, you know, you had to really think long and hard about making a click call to your parents to <laughs> pay for it, you know, mm. because it was hugely expensive. Uh, you know, desperate if you could get through the lines on a Christmas day to talk to your family, you know. Um, you get those little aerogram letters. Yeah, the blue ones. Yeah, and yeah. the letter would arrive, and the news was three weeks old, and my, none of my family are very good at communicating. So, you know, I got home. When I used to come back to Rotorua, I'd see a whole lot of letters that had been started but never been never posted. Um, so, you know, a, part, a large part of it is homesickness. I mean, without a doubt. You know, it's just, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, you can't even begin to explain to people these days what it's like because you know when I won a British Open and anything I get sent a telegram you know and like yeah. I, I used to have sackfuls of them when I first started winning but after a while people just thought I was going to win so I never bothered to get a telegram except from Auntie Maisie from Ekatahuna you know um, but yeah it was um, but everyone was in the same boat back then right so you know it was um, I mean a story that I do tell is that my parents hadn't travelled very far in their lifetime. You know, I don't think, I don't think they went overseas until they were in their. Oh, in fact, I can't even think until, until this time. But my mum, my brother lived in France. He was a squash coach, and my family got together and sent my mother to, see Mark and Julie in France. But the premise was that she was there as a safety net. Mm. In case it all turned to custard for me, but. She never came and watched me play in England or did anything like that. It was just that this, and I never knew that until oh, I. Yeah. How long was she there for? Oh, a month or so. You know, it was around. Far out. Yeah, so it was really strange. It was like, but yeah. But, you know, I mean, everyone says it's good character building stuff, but I think there's probably a few people that would have gone on further in their squash careers if that hadn't happened to them in their first. It's not, it's not a way to nurture and protect and look after athletes it's it was what happened in those days but you know i'm sure there are better ways than doing it now and hopefully we do do it different i like hearing though about the tough times because people think susan devoy just the world champ and it, it sort of all came easy and naturally but those tough years like a lot of people going through tough times and their life or their sport you push through and you see results on the other side but when you did win your first title uh, tw uh age 20 i think it was um did a lot of that emotion come out of, of the, the struggles you'd been through earlier? Like, what do you remember about winning, winning your first title? Um, well, I won a lot of titles in my <laughs> lifetime, and it's funny, you remember the first and the last, you, the rest are a bit of a blur in the middle, but I remember, um, I remember the first, and the first thing I did was run, run off the court, of course, to that telephone, that youth, and ring my parents, who were sitting at the end of the phone with the Daily Post, you know, cameraman there, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, my sort of planning had been that I might win the British Open in the next year, in 85. That was how we'd sort of plan things as progress was going. Uh, so it was, while not altogether surprising that I did win, it was still a little, you know, sooner than expected. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's sort of a... I mean, the first title is so fantastic because there's this enormous sense of elation that you've actually done what you set out to do from the very beginning. You know, that's... Um, no one can describe that sort of feeling of finally making it. Um, and and that's why I suppose the rest are a blur because once you become number one, it's a bit like what Paul Cole has gone through, you know, you it, it changes. You always think, it, it just becomes so much harder defending a title, winning something when you've already won it before and staying there. And so, yeah, that you relish the first because it's sort of the best and the easiest in some ways if that makes sense mm. and, and does it change like the circumstance that all oh, of a sudden changed overnight. I mean, sponsors it was, yeah. or money or you're no longer sleeping yeah. on couches yeah. it's single beds now or what's yeah. the well it's, squash has never been the um, you know most prolific uh, sport with prize money um, in fact it hasn't changed all that much because I, I remember that in my last British Open in 1992 I won 8,000 pounds which was a lot of money in those days, actually. And Paul Cole won the British Open, and he got $24,000. Really? So mm. I think that might have been US dollars, but still, yeah. it's not a lot no. of difference, is it? No. You know, so uh, I don't think there are too many wealthy squash players around in the world, but um, they're also they're doing okay, and they're doing what they love. But, yeah, no, it did change. I remember getting an invitation to New Zealand House for afternoon tea and you know I got back and Honda gave me a little Honda City car <laughs> nice. and um, yeah I mean it just it virtually changed overnight you know and um, and that's another thing that you have to become accustomed and used to is rather than just training and you know I went on and kept winning and winning and winning and so I, I did pretty well for myself because I was a small fish in a big pond yeah, big fish in a small pond here in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I got plenty of really good sponsorships and partnerships and things, but there was also an obligation to fulfill that. And that sometimes... And I used to always wake up in the morning and say, whatever I do today will not interrupt in my training. Yeah, I, I don't want to gloss over what you did achieve. There, there'll be some listeners who perhaps aren't aware. So you won eight British Open women's titles between 84 and 92, four World Opens, 12 majors, third on the all-time list. Like a huge deal, like and and I was very young at this time. But I asked my parents about it. I was like, "Who would you say has a similar profile now?" And probably like a Val Adams. You know, everyone knows Val Adams. Everyone knew Susan Devoy. Was it like when you're walking down the street, you'd get attention? You know, like, what do you remember about your profile at its absolute peak? Um, yeah, I mean, I would you know have to say that I was probably a household name in those days um, and for squash which enjoyed a really good profile in the media you know and um, which it's you know struggled of course in the last few years I was you know regularly making the news um, and also for squash as you sort of understand that it's not like it's not like Valerie who was amazing goes to perhaps a world champs every year and a few diamond leagues and then the commonwealth games and an olympics we play all the time so uh, we might play 15 16 tournaments over a year so you're regularly winning and being in the mm. you know so um and that's what i really loved about squash was the ability to be able to play at a whole lot of events all the time i, I think i'd go potty if i played a sport that was just you know every four years or yeah every two years and once a year you go to this, I mean, God, I'd say, what was the point? <laughs> Speaking of going potty, um, just to take a slight deviation, you mentioned billeting or being billeted before. Oh, you've that story too. Where did you get that's, that one from? That's a nice seg. Eh? You are, yeah, yeah. Really, are you well, really where well done, Where did you Shay? get that story from? Yeah, we've, got our, we've got our sources. Look, I won't do the story justice, yeah. so you please. You actually do a bit of work. You don't just swan up here and, you know, no. the microphones no. out. Oh, no. Yeah. no. Yeah. So please. Being um, billeted in Melbourne with a family of hillbillies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've just come from Adelaide where I won the South Australian Open and had... Um, lovely rose bowl trophy and I was billeted with a family that turned up and uh, drove me sort of out into the boondocks really um, which is fine you know although not terribly ideal for travel to practice and whatever and um, they were real 
hillbillies <laughs> and uh, they had an outside toilet, which is fine. Um, it wasn't wasn't a long drop, but an outside toilet. And the mum and dad and a whole heap of kids and the parents had given up their room for me and they were sleeping on the floor on a mattress. And so I went to bed uh, that night and I woke up in the middle of the night having to go to the toilet and I thought, oh God, how do I manoeuvre myself through the lounge to the outside toilet? Oh no. You know, this is all a bit much. So I thought, well, perhaps I could jump out the window, mm. you know, but the windows were all covered in those mosquito net things, you know, <laughs> that were hammered to the wall. <laughs> and so I peed in my trophy. Susan, you didn't. I did. <laughs> I, filled, I filled my rose bowl. And, uh, and then in the morning I covered it with a towel and <laughs> discreetly went to the bathroom pretending that that was my toilet bag. And I've told that story, I told that story a few times. Of course, people now say that they're never going to drink out of a trophy again <laughs> no, if they, if they yeah, win. Oh, so... <laughs> There you go. Trophies right. come in handy. Is it a deep rose bowl? Yeah, well, how deep is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we won't go into detail. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, every no, time no. I've had to use an item, like a medium drink at a, from a fast food restaurant, doesn't do it justice. No. You've got to get a large drink to, no. to get the volume in. But uh, look, I've, di- I've digressed. I don't know how you got that story. Oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, we've got our, we've got our mm. sources. <laughs> got our sources. Um, so what, talk to me about the mental strength of staying on top. You said it's, it's tough to defend titles. What was it that motivated you to keep going? Was prize money a factor? Was it just you wanted, you know, when you retired to be the greatest? What was it that sort of pushed your buttons? A combination of um, of things, really. Um, you know, I mean, I uh, it's a great feeling being, uh, you know, the best at something in the world. But I didn't wake up in the morning and think, "Hey, is in the world a better place to have me because I'm a world champion or whatever." Um, it was really, I think, the desire to always be better, you know, that looking for that constant, constantly looking for that perfect performance, which of course never happens. But, you know, regardless of how good you are, there's always room for improvement. And um, so, you know, I was motivated by f- the fear of losing, which is quite debilitating. It didn't debilitate me, you know, as such, but I know that psycho- I would have been a psychologist's nightmare, you know, because. <laughs> yeah. um, Every time I competed in a major, major event, particularly the British and the Worlds and that, it was the fear of losing that sort of became my motivation, which is, they, t- they say, is not necessarily a good thing. Um, and ironically, as I got more titles and became more successful, I became more nervous to the fact that, you know, it nearly crippled me. And prob- that's probably a lot of part that people don't know. Um, but I was able to sort of contain that um, mostly on a few occasions, you know, John and I would talk about, you know, I'd get what like a glass elbow because my winning shot was my backhand drop. Um, and if that didn't go well, uh, not that my game, I mean, the good thing about not the good thing about me, what I pride myself on is I could be playing crap and still win, mm. you know, because I knew what it took to just dig in and grind. Uh, you know, I mean, I would probably never be written up as the most flamboyant shot making person in the whole world but I mean who cares my name's on the trophies people don't look at that so yeah um, but as I said I loved uh, the reason I retired wasn't because I wasn't enjoying you know my life Oh, well I wasn't enjoying my life as a professional athlete I was just sick I didn't have that flame anymore to want to get up every morning and go and train for five or six hours a day so you Mm. know when that happens you really know there's no alternative how did that nervousness manifest? What, what does that mean? Like, was it the, the the day of competing, the day of the final, that you wouldn't sleep the night before, you'd be a mess in the morning? Like, um, no, generally I was always all right leading up to the tournament. I would know when it was really bad the minute I stepped on the court, you know, for a big final because it would suddenly be this enormous knot in your stomach and after running around for a little bit, it would sort of like be virtually like a stitch really. In fact, you'd think, you'd actually ask yourself if you were fit enough because you'd be sort of nearly hyperventilating and whatever. But, you know, I had a few tools, I suppose. You know, I mean, just hitting the ball out and keep playing and whatever. And generally, I, I think I can't think of many occasions where it didn't sort of go out, but it wasn't all the time, but it was just interesting after all of those years that it was something that I developed later rather than what I had at the beginning. You know, it was something like... And I think it was that whole fear of losing, you know, the pressure that was put upon you. And because, you know, undeniably, when I went on and played, everyone thought I was going to win. 
mm. you know, for a while. Well, not for a while, for a long time, you know, and, uh, you know, it became sort of the stage, well, it was only news if I didn't win. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I think that became a bit, a little bit of a burden and was quite difficult to deal with. And in those days, you didn't go and ask for help. Well, you didn't know where to go to ask for help, you know. There wasn't sort of any... Oh, and if you did, it was like you were a bit loopy. Yeah. You know? mm. There's something wrong with you going yeah. to see us. It's exactly what Sir John Kerwin said when we spoke yeah. to him. Same thing, same era. Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you know, you were told to toughen up and get on with it, or you know, that's a bit sign of weakness or whatever. And you know, and I probably, oh, well, not probably, I did think that myself. You know, I mean, how ridiculous to think that someone's been at the top of the world for six years finally getting nervous. You know, and um, so yeah, I mean, those were sort of things that you had to deal with. Was that heightened around 1987 when you won the World Open here in New Zealand? That weight of expectation? Yeah, yeah, I think that was probably, um, you know, one of the toughest uh, torments. I think it's it's not so much it was really about the pressure and all that. It's just that, you know, I used to know that the minute mm. I shut that door on that glass court and that little fishbowl that um, I'd done everything humanly possible mm. to prepare for and I was, barring illness or injury, I was going to win. You know, I mean, that sounds very arrogant, but actually that's, you know, you've done the work. And so so I suppose on the times that I did get nervous, perhaps I was a little short on my preparation or, you know, I'd had been a little sick or something like that. Um, you know, pressure seems to manifest itself in different ways that, you know, I can, more than a few occasions where I would get sick, you know. Physically ill? No, like no. a couple of weeks before a tournament, I'd start to get a cold or generally mm. a cold or something like that. And I always thought that was, I learned, you know, you, that's not trial and error because you haven't got any advice. It was that I was probably overtraining and, you know, my body was saying, you know, come on, this is rest time. So, you know, it would only ever take illness to stop me from training, you know. So, um, yeah. I mean, you look back now, don't you, and you perhaps you've, I don't know if I'm speaking through a hole in my head, but <laughs> it was sort of very different than, mm, yeah. than what we see today. Link us up to, to the decision to retire early, um, and it kind of came in two acts, right? Uh, if I've got it right, and if you're open to talking about it, I think you had a miscarriage and your father had a stroke. Mm. Was it the same day or around the same time? Yeah, same day. Um, are yeah. you able to, to yeah. tell us about that? Well, period? in 1991, you know, I'd won seven British Opens in a row. John had... St- you know, we'd always travelled together and whatever, and he'd stayed back here in uh, New Zealand because um, the life of Riley for him was about to end, and I told him he needed to get a real job. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so he'd gone in, uh, you know, gone into business here, and so I went over on my own, which was, you know, I hadn't done that for years. Uh, a new base changed my training base, and uh, and it was okay. It wasn't, you know wasn't fantastic but um, I lost in the British Open in the quarterfinals which is you know was big news and mm. a little unheard of and oh, and I came back to New Zealand um, I was I was gutted you know embarrassing now when I think about the way I behave when I lose <laughs> not publicly yeah, okay. <laughs> don't worry I think I went to the movies for a week you know sat in the dark of the movies because John used to always come over and at the end of the British Opens he would go away with a group of guys and go and play golf somewhere in Portugal or something like that. That was, and then we would make our way back to New Zealand. But um, anyway, I you know picked my socks up and carried on. And I was playing in the Australian Open, and I um, I lost in that. And I said to John, I just don't just don't feel a hundred percent. I don't know quite what's wrong with me. And I went back to New Zealand to play in the New Zealand Open, and I went to the doctors. And you know I've got to be really sick to go to the doctors. And he yeah. said you couldn't be pregnant, could you? And I said, oh well, I could, but doubt it you know um and so I was and I was um well on you Mm. know and here it was like on a Tuesday and I was playing the New Zealand Open and I hadn't been pregnant before so I didn't know whether you could or couldn't play or you know and so um and my parents were coming to Hamilton that night to watch me play in the New Zealand Open and uh, my dad had a stroke behind the wheel of the car in Hamilton, and so he went to uh, intensive care unit Waikato Hospital, and we were there with him. And then that night, when I was home, I had a miscarriage. Jeez. Um, so yeah, it was pretty catastrophic, really, but not. 
I mean, not not so much for me, but for him. And then it was sort of like, you know, the anus horribilis year of what the hell am I doing this for? What's the point, you know, really? And my dad eventually got transferred back to Rotorua Hospital and, you know, he'd lost his... I mean, he never regained proper movement again and, you know, had to walk with a stick and the inability to communicate and uh, it was it's just horrible really um, but because of that I'd never really I never really even thought about my own circumstances and you know I wasn't grieving or anything like that it was I was very pragmatic about it it wasn't like you know I'm dismissing anyone else who's had a miscarriage but that was just for me it was like well, this happened for a reason, you know, and um, and my father's more important because he's still here. And then um, I think that was I was pretty much done and dusted then. And I used to go up and see my dad most days in the hospital, and or every day. And there was um, a guy next to him in the bed, and he used to, you know, he eventually started chatting about squash and doing whatever. And you know, and one day he said, "Oh yeah, why aren't you training anymore? Do you, are you still training?" And I said, "No, no, no, no," and you know. And he said, oh, something like, something to the effect, oh, I love it when you, you know, stick it up the Aussies or <laughs> something like that. I don't know, it was a series of things. And then um, it was sort of getting to the end of the year and uh, I said to John, well, it's do or die now. You know, I've got to decide what I'm going to do. And I was still running and fitness and all that, but I wasn't playing squash and whatever. So first time in my life probably I hadn't trained for five, six hours a day. And then he said to me, Susan, if you don't go to and play in the Dutch Open in Amsterdam in December, he said, you're going to lose your world ranking. Well, that's, oh, God, that can't possibly happen. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, basically I got on a plane, got off the plane, played in the Dutch Open and won miraculously and uh, got back on the plane and got home for Christmas and decided, yep, I'm going to give it another year. And the first time ever I got a personal fitness trainer who was one of the guys <laughs> at Les Mills who, you know, one of the, and that was all the rage, you know. One on one, on one they called it, I think. One on one. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and I went and had the best year of my life, you know, squash. Oh, well, not the best year of my life, but the best sporting. You won everything, year. right? Yeah, everything. Yeah. If, like, literally, everything. literally yeah, everything. everything. Yeah, I didn't lose that year. Yeah. Wow. So, um, and so when I got to October and the Worlds were in Vancouver, um, I just woke up in the morning and said to John, when I lose tonight, that's it. I'm retiring. He just about, you know, fell off the bed. <laughs> and do you think we should talk about this? <laughs> yeah. Do you think we should have a discussion? You might change your mind. I said no. And I didn't know at the time that I was actually pregnant. Oh, so, wow. So, yeah, I was pregnant with Aunt Julian, our eldest. So it was meant to be, wasn't it? Yeah. And then that's that transition we talked about from yeah. being the world class squash player to being a mum of of four and five years. Yeah. Yeah. Like wow! So just out of curiosity, what was the score in that last game in Vancouver? Oh, I don't know. Because I just I'm just thinking now, like that 20 year period from nine year old losing nine love nine love nine love, and your first competitive game at a tournament to going out as a world champion is quite a it's a nice arc. It's quite a nice 20 year arc of a squash career, which is pretty yeah. special. Yeah, 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 it is. If someone had said to me, you know, if I had a crystal ball and said, hey, Susan, in five years' time you're going to have four sons, under five I would have probably kept playing squash for at least another couple <laughs> of years and only, and only had two. <laughs> but no, no, no. So it was a... Uh, um, uh, uh, and I think, for me, personally, it was a blessing that I was expecting or having a baby because I don't think I, in hindsight just retiring then and then with no actual I mean the idea was we were going to have a family but you didn't know how long that was going to take or when it was going to happen so for me it really those next five years I was so busy and my mind was so consumed with being a mother that I know there's a lot of stories of hero to zero when people retire and they suddenly think you know what am I going to do with the rest of my life but mine was the complete opposite. Hmm. How was it received by the New Zealand media when you retired do you remember was it a big big deal news newspaper radio for like a week or so or? Um, I can't remember no 
Yeah. The Women's Weekly or Women's Day or anything oh, come probably, calling? Bound to. Yeah. Bound to. It's probably on the picture of the TV guide. I'm sure, yeah. Or something, you know. Susan Devoy, um, Women's Days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was a bit of a shock, it? actually, if I recall. You know, I think there was a bit of a uh, shock. Um, it must have been a Holmes show. You must have been called on to Paul Holmes or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember after the World Champs getting up early in the morning going and being on the Holmes show and um, you know, going into a studio and speaking to him live. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was a good friend, Paul Holmes. He was a, a real hard case. When you reach back into the recesses, is that a really, really distant memory, all those times? Or are they, do they come forward quite quickly and you're very fond of them? Mm. As I said, I only remember the first and the last. I, wouldn't, I couldn't even tell you who I beat in the finals of most British Opens or World Champs. Oh, I mean, I probably could if I jogged my memory or thought yeah. about it. John could. He's sort of an encyclopedia. But, um, you know, it's... It doesn't define who I am, and I think, uh, and I think that's the other reason I wanted to retire because I didn't want that just to be the only part of my life. I'd done and done that, you know, and there was a lot more living to do and other things to, you know, mm. to tackle and whatever. So yeah, I mean, I, I always think it's great to go out on top. It's not for everyone, and no, not everybody has to go out on top. You know, it doesn't make you the ultimate champion if you do. But um, for me. It was like, after the year I'd had before, it was like, yep, I'm done and dusted now. You know, got through that, achieved what I set out to do, and, uh, you know, we can move on to other things now. I've got the timelines a bit mixed up here, but I want to talk about your big walk in 1988, which was right in the middle of being the best in the world. Um, and it raised $500,000 in 1988, which mm. is an insane amount of money. 1988. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. what I? Not what I you said. Oh, the second time you said no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When there were no S-Boss machines. No yeah, S-Boss so machines. So, so 2,500 yeah. miles in seven weeks, and like that's an insane thing to do in the middle of being the best in the world. Like that was for muscular dystrophy, wasn't it? Yeah, it was insane, really. <laughs> Which way did you go? Uh, well, we um, we weren't allowed to walk across the Harbour Bridge, so we started on the North Shore and walked up to the Cape. And then we flew back to Invercargill. Oh, yeah. And went to Bluff, actually. So uh, my claim to fame is I had a drink in the northernmost southern pubs in New Zealand within 12 hours. Nice. Oh, wow. Uh, and then we walked from... It's good prep for a long walk. Yeah. A couple walk of pints. From, <laughs> yeah, walked from Bluff uh, all the way up to, back up to Auckland. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was a... Um, I mean, uh, that's... So I was based at a club in the UK in Marlow called the Oasis Club and uh, a number of the people that were members there or came to the club were part of Ian Botham's uh, support group when he did the walks for child cancer, he walked the length of the UK and I got to know some of those people pretty well and alongside that I came back to New Zealand and a friend of mine, uh, Susie Simcott was involved in squash, her husband was the medical patron of the Muscular Dystrophy Association asked me one night that someone had let them down and he asked me if I would go and give a little speech to know whether it was their AGM or something it wasn't it wasn't a huge and so I went along and didn't really know what to expect or what to say and I met you know some families and some kids and it wasn't until we were driving home and um, John Simcock told me you know what muscular dystrophy was and how it affected and you know I'd never been exposed to anything like that in my life I was only 25 and but it was sort of you know a bit of a put life into perspective sort of you know here I was le leaving, le leaving a pretty privileged life of doing what I love and travelling the world uh, and he said you know they, um, there was a family there with three boys um, David Stewart and James and their parents Alison and Don and they lived in a farm in Topri and both their boys had Duchenne dystrophy and they were like oh, I don't know might have been 11 and 12 or 12 and 13 and John told me what their life was going to be like and their expectancy that they would live to their late teens, early 20s or whatever. And So, you know, it sort of mould around in my mind and I said to John, you know, I'd quite like to do a length, walk the length of New Zealand. Um, you know, I'd been on the circuit since I was 17. It was a long time, eight years. I felt like I needed to do or wanted to do something different. Uh, it wasn't like I was this amazing altruistic philanthropic queen because I wasn't um, but it seemed to combine a dual purpose of 
undertaking a challenge to walk the length of New Zealand and then to you know raise some money and some awareness for a charity and um, yeah it was it was phenomenal it was probably the, one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life you know and um, and it changed my life you know had the most uh, most profound effect on my own what I wanted to do for the you know next part of my life so that family came with us and you know the challenges of living and traveling around with two boys who are you know physically disabled and but it, you know it was their sort of approach to life and the things and then in every center we'd get a whole lot of other families with children with muscular dystrophy and you know we'd stop at the pub the pub would be our meeting place every and yeah it was just and look we we walked our asses off you know like yeah. we averaged I think oh well some days we did 70 k's some days we did 50 and if we had functions because it wasn't we would just walk all day because we'd walk all day and then we'd go to the rotary club or someone had raised money and they just I think wow we raised so much um, and yeah. so it was cool how did you raise so much money and how did people donate in 1988 well, honestly we were just checks uh, checks but checks. cash checks really? and cash cash and functions so you know we would know the local school would walk with us one day we John organized it all is phenomenal so weeks before say Susan's coming through town the schools would have muffety days and then walk with us and so they'd raise money rotary clubs would donate us a check um, we had some quite big sponsors we had tip top bread every day would drop us off a tray of bread and big bean pies you know um, so yeah we got a lot of Jason's travel covered all the accommodation, um, so everything was covered, and all that we raised could be. And you know, I you say half a million. That is, that's an awful lot of money, wasn't it? Yes. In, in those days, but um, yeah, it was cool. And you know, we finished the walk, and a few years later, I came back and I went to that Elvis boy's funeral, and then I went to the next boy's funeral, and then the dad had you know looked after those boys. He died of cancer, and I thought, God, where's the fairness in that? And that was how I got involved with the Halberg Trust because Sir Murray Halberg arrived one day uh, out of a helicopter when I was walking through the Mamakus and, you know, gave me a cheque for $5,000 from the Halberg Trust and then asked me to be a trustee. And I thought, ooh, that's a bit quid pro quo. Isn't it? <laughs> and so I went on the trust. I was the youngest trustee by a considerable number of years and I was the only woman for a considerable number of years. But um, so that started that long relationship. And that's how I sort of, you know, uh, became involved in in what I thought was going to be, you know, aside from being a mother, was going to be dominate the next part of my my entire life. Really, was you know, I thought I'd just be a charity queen, <laughs> not like that, but you know what? Mm. But life didn't work turn out like that either. I can say. Yeah, I'm keen to link that up to the uh, race relations commissioner job. Um, which is an incredibly interesting part me and Shay have been looking forward to sort of getting into. Um, how does that work? Are you, you sort of shoulder tapped uh, as someone who would be good for it or do you apply for the job? Um, you know, I think when I, when I was appointed, people, you know, thought I was the most unlikely candidate for that job because I think people pigeonhole you and categorise you in certain things that I was known for, A, you know, being a former world champion or whatever and then you know chairman of the Albert Trust or but little else um, but I had you know I'd been on a number of crown entity boards and you know I'd been involved I mean I did a stint on the Auckland District Health Board and so you know I wasn't just sitting there because um, it's 20 years right it's another 20 exactly, fast forward another 20 exactly. years from you finishing squash yeah. to taking up this role and the thing is that what I'd done in those 20 years wasn't high profile or but it was the necessary grounding I suppose or and or qualifications if you call them that for being able to do a job possibly doing a job like that but an interesting way I got the job I was sitting on the couch one Sunday night filing, folding the 17 loads of washing that you have when you have four sons uh, and the phone rang and it was Andrew Bridgman he said hello good evening Dame Susan I'm Andrew Bridgman I'm the CEO of the Ministry of Justice and I thought well, no, I didn't think. I didn't laugh first. Yeah. I thought, oh, God. Shit, well, done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no what, not what have I done. <laughs> what have one of them done? Or something, you know, I was getting to that stage in age. Uh, anyway, he said, look, I've been asked to um, inquire whether you'd be interesting, interested in applying for the role of race relations commissioner. And, 
And I just said, well, could you please send me the you know, job description and details? And so I did. I applied. And I went through a series of interviews, the way you'd think it, you know, Michael Jones and Irene Van Dyke and anyone else to turn the job down. And I was the last cab standing. That's the way it was sort of portrayed, wasn't it? Um, and I went for an interview. And I hadn't heard for a while. Uh, I had two interviews, actually. And then um, I was going to school one day, boys' college. And the phone rang. I think one of the boys had left their cricket gear at home. And the phone call was, oh, good afternoon, Susan. It's um, Judith Collins here. And I went, oh, look, um, sorry, Judith, I'm just uh, rushing out the door. I've got to take the boys' cricket gear to school. Um, I've got your number here. I'll give you a buzz back, okay? I didn't even register who Judith Collins was. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know, I thought it must have been a teacher from the school or something, you know, oh, someone trying crazy. to get me to write a recipe for a kindergarten book or something. And so I went off. And then I, as I was driving home, I thought, oh, oh. Is Judith Collins? <laughs> Who was Minister for of Justice, Justice at yeah, that stage. Yeah, so she makes the appointment and so she rang and said, look, um, the interview panel, panel have recommended you for the job. I'd like to offer it to you. And, um, and that's how it happened. Very complex, uh, controversial role. How much thought, uh, was it days, weeks, you thought about whether or not you were actually going to do it? Um... Well, I think for the process from the time I was interviewed to when she rang was so long, oh, you know, longer than a normal job application that I thought, well, probably I haven't got it, you know, and they're just waiting to... Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm of the mindset, don't think about something you can't do, think about something you can do, you know. But I had a real, as you know, a bit of a baptism of fire. I was sort of public enemy number one for a whole lot of reasons. Mm. Um, so that was pretty stressful um, you know the news reporters parked at the end of my driveway and you know when I started work here I worked in Zurich House which is now being demolished for the Britama, yeah, the train uh, and you know TV stations would be parked out there early in the morning I'd go up the service lift and whatever and so yeah I mean you know I got I got it from all all sides really um, and it was it was pretty difficult, um, but in, in, in hindsight, it was great because I thought, well, it can't get anything worse than this, can it? I did a couple of times, but generally it didn't. Yeah, um, was that what you expected? Did you expect it to be so tough? Uh, I didn't expect my introduction to the role to be quite so controversial or, you know, um, I mean, I thought, yes, there'll be people out there that certainly won't agree with that appointment, but you know, at least give me a chance to muck it up before you have a go at me. Um, I think the very nature of the role, the fact that I was the Race Relations Commissioner and I was a white Pākehā woman was, you know, uh, not e what people expected that person to be in that role, you know, so, um, and you know, there was a lot of internal mechanisms at the Commission, they were going through a restructure and, you know, for whatever reason they had decided even internally that a lot of them didn't want me not that they didn't like me they didn't want me either so I was sort of battling it on all, all sides you know and at the same time trying to understand what exactly my role was and how I was going to do it so so basically all I did was you get uh, you get invited to the opening of an envelope if you're the race relations commissioner I mean you can be working 24 7 if you want to uh, and you receive a lot a lot of invitations so basically I just went to everything in the beginning and um you know, whether it's, I mean, I've eaten a lot of dumplings and a lot of curries and drunk lots of cups of tea and, but you go to all these functions and, you know, I, what I first observed when I went there was, you know, the front rows reserved for all the politicians. They all come along and shake their hands or their whatever and they usually do that, get the selfie moment and then they're gone and what I learnt was I'm really good at, I think I'm really good at building relationships. I'd stay afterwards for the cups of tea and then suddenly you meet the people mm. You know, you understand the issues and, you know, you get to start to build trust. And, you know, at the very beginning, I needed all of them to do my job. And at the end of it, they all needed me, you mm. know, to promote. Well, not to promote, but to... So, yeah, I think what the public see of the role is the contentious issues when a person has a brain fade and makes a racist comment. And that's when the commissioner becomes involved or, or in other things. What they don't see is all the other things that go on behind the scenes and how important your role is to actually stand up for the human rights of all New Zealanders, but actually to try and implement and make effective change in policy and other things. So it's not 
it's not just going to the opening of an envelope, you yeah. know. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, and there are a lot of issues. Uh, there are a lot of issues in New Zealand, and um, and there still is. So yeah, I, um, you know, I was involved in the petition to government around the historic state of use. I would say that not just myself, but people in the Human Rights Commission played a huge role in making sure that the government made, took an inquiry into that. Um, yeah, I mean, we had our first anti-racism campaign. I mean, albeit it was a small gloss over with Taika Waititi fronting mm. it, but it didn't cost any taxpayer money, you know, and it started a conversation. Um, and, you know, raised a whole lot of... And I think the fact that I was white and I was probably not the norm as a sports person, a whole different audience listened, you know, that... Mm. I was, was going to say that. I was yeah. like, I almost didn't even know the role existed. I know. Until you were appointed to it, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. there's a role, and here's you front and centre copying it. Yeah. And, and interesting, you know, some of my biggest detractors at the beginning were some of my greatest, well, not supporters, but, you know, it's a big thing to turn around and say, look, we thought you were, you know, um, Mike Smith, Margaret Mutu, you know, a whole lot of people, Oscar Keitley, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a complex, 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 complex job. It's just, it's so broad and wide. But, you know, I was not the Indigenous Commissioner. You know, I wasn't responsible for, you know, um, the treaty or all that sort of thing. And But people assumed that I was because it's a race relation. And I would have sort of assumed you'd have a role in that too. So it's all a bit flawed. But, um, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, I mean, it was an extraordinarily tough gig, but it was also a real privilege. Mm. If you're open to talking about it, the 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 worst times was it was it death threats? Like, how bad did things get? Um, yeah, I had a couple of de- death threats. It started off um, just with kneecapping, and then went to death threats. <laughs> 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 uh, I think it was the abuse that was pretty. Um, I got physically abused one day uh, walking up Mount Monganui up Moa, which is my happy place, so that was, you know, a bit confronting. Um, and in fact, the other day, I was just going up there and someone called me a, well, I won't repeat it on, mm. but, you know, an in loving whatever, and I thought, you know. No way. Um, but there were days where I'd come home and my whole front door was pasted with uh, Hobson's Pledges, Hobson Pledge leaflets, or uh, there was one incident that you know got completely out of hand here where I was the patron of the Auckland Regional Migrant Services and they had a rather than having a Christmas dinner they changed it to a I don't know a season's lunch or a, I don't know a fest, fest of something took the word Christmas out you know because most of the people that attended there aren't Christians um, and it was just lunch you know and it was to be all inclusive and to enable because when you know when other uh, religions or ethnicities look and see Christmas, they think that doesn't include them. So, yeah. But, man, you would think that I was trying to get Christmas, that I had, you know, yeah. I had real big power and I was going to get Christmas <laughs> abolished in the entire world. And so I got sent a big parcel, which was beautifully wrapped at my door, and it was full of dog feces. Oh, no. And I got sent all these Christmas... I nev- you know, people never send Christmas cards. I got lots of Christmas cards. You know, ironically, all written probably by Christians. Mm. You know, this mm. that was a really... Um, weird thing about it so um, yeah and just the barrage of abuse for everything it was you know I mean I've never I don't follow anything on social media so you know thank goodness I don't Uh, but people will tell me sometimes or you know it's not like I don't know what's going on I just refuse to allow myself to be because you could never you would never survive otherwise but but, you know ironically the complaints and abuse I got uh, predominantly from a generation of white middle-aged people mm. isn't it who feel so threatened mm. by something that there is nothing to be threatened about by losing something that wasn't theirs to begin with mm. and I just think it's very sad that you know that this is still exists in our country and I think at the moment it's getting worse you know I think we have a very divisive situation in New Zealand which has been compounded by what's happened with you know the the mandating and all of those sorts of things, um, and with the the co governance, and we only hear the or the three waters is that we are very ignorant and uninformed as a group of people who I think think or or I believe in the ability to protest, but are protesting at the wrong things 
because actually nothing is going to be lost, but there is an awful lot that can be gained. But I have a whole lot of hope that the next generation is okay, and your children will probably be even better, and more informed than my children. But because that's what you advocated for, wasn't it? Essentially, is understanding other cultures that live here. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, funny enough, that most New Zealanders, and this is you know, comes through our complaint system and research. Believe it or not, the thing that they're most are discriminative against is the treaty. Mm. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah, that, that's, you know, funny thing, the people that complain to me were mostly, as I said, Pākehās, or complain about being called Pākehās as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, rather than, because they've never experienced any form of racis, racial discrimination in their life, which made me laugh, and they're the ones that are complaining because they think it's reverse racism mm. or whatever. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I do, I think we've made, you know, we've headed in leaps and bounds as a country, and I think, you know, look at Australia, I think if, Albanese is serious about his statement to the Illawarra, uh, Uluru, Illawarra, <laughs> rugby league team, isn't it? Yeah. The Uluru statement, then they're beginning the journey that we've done, you know, yeah. since the Waitangi Trim in 75. So, yeah, I, um, look, I'm starting to sound like I learned something in my job. Well, I, was, I wanted I? to ask that, like, during that five-year kind of journey, how much did your personal kind of views change through what you were exposed to? I don't, think allowed to be I don't think my to. personal views changed. I think, you know, I've always, because of the work that I've done within the disability sector, I've always believed, I mean, I've always been a fighter for the underdog. I've always believed that, you know, um, it's not it's not a level playing field for everybody. But um, uh, I, I think my views changed in terms of I was, uh, not so much my views, but my world view in my own repository of, Educating because of all the, you know, I mean, you know, the Quran and you know, the Muslim community, the Indian community, the Chinese community, you know, our refugee community, all of those things, you know, you can't help but be immersed in it and come out hopefully a better person. Um, and whilst there's a lot of negativity, I still think that we're a great little country at the end of the world. We don't want to see our bar so low and compare ourselves to Australia or anything like that yeah. because you know we can we've got we do have the ability to actually be world le- world leading in this, but it's a bit scary at the moment. Is it true that when you started, you were informed not to actually use the the term racist, yeah. not to refer to people as as racist? Yeah. What was the thinking behind that? Well, I think I think the thinking may have been that it would draw attention to. That we didn't want to raise concern that you know it's always like it was always like an intent to play down the fact that you know whilst racism exists in New Zealand we don't want to um, elevate it to a level where it starts being you know because the thing is that uh, is people hate hate being called racist mm. you know it's like um, but you people know, that aren't overtly racist hate being called <laughs> racist yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people that are really racist, they actually think it's a compliment. But right. most people are in some shape or form. We all have prejudices and we've probably all been guilty of saying something racist and nobody likes to be challenged on that. And it's like anything, just own it and, you know, apologise and fix it. You know, like um, one of the funniest stories I was not long after I started, it must have been when Winston was still in Parliament. Well, not not the last election. Still is, isn't he? Well, <laughs> So it's nearly 10 years next year since I started that role. But anyway, he was campaigning down here, launching New Zealand's first, whatever, manifesto for the election. And he said, two Wongs don't make a white. Mm, I remember that. Remember that. And so I got lots, you get lots of commentary about that and people expect you to say something because you know what? Sensible Chinese New Zealanders are sick to death of having the mickey taken out of it, sick to death of having to tell their children that people won't pronounce their names, you know, and all that. And of course, Winston just says, "Oh, you know, you're too PC, and you're not doing this, and you know." Uh, and then someone sent me a letter. I've, one of the few things that I've kept, actually, um, and it was a picture of Winston's head superimposed on a uh, person in hospital um, with their leg, you know, in traction. And the doctor was Asian, and it had Solly Wong leg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, but you know, because you're going to put this on here, Winston, and I've had sort of. Um, words over the years because that's my role and that's his role um, and nothing of it is personal you know like if 
Winston, if you're listening, we, you and I know that none of this is personal. And Winston's uh, a big fan of Between Two Beers. He tunes that, into that, most of it. That's a really interesting point. Cause no, that's but everyone that thinks because I made that, that's just a true commentary of what Winston said, you know, mm. and that's what I had to deal with and that's what happened. But, you know, that's um, that's part and parcel of the, the role of a race relations commissioner is to call people out or, or hold them to account when things like that happen. Winston couldn't care less about, you know... Um, I mean, we had a run and went in, you know, and often things get taken out of con- context and misconstrued and the media will blow things up. It's like they want to pit people against each that's other. What I'm, that's what I was about to say is that it's yeah. we get the headline, yeah. we don't get the nuance, no, the conversation no. that goes on behind no. what we pick up or read. And um, as he's coming back into uh, government, isn't he, I, he's got bigger fish to fry, worry about, you know, so... <laughs> Good luck, Winston. Ele- <laughs> Good luck, Winston, in the election next year. Yeah. I'll be rooting for you. I do want to make a really vague sporting comparison. So we we spoke earlier, or you spoke earlier about the weight of expectation on um, wanting to achieve. Was there a similar weight of expectation when you were in this role to make genuine change? Uh, there was, but you learnt early on that it's near no, near nigh impossible. You know. Um, so the Human Rights Commission, of course, you know, they, they report to the United Nations on a whole lot of different, um, you know, have reports on where, how we're doing a disability, LGBTI issues, you know, race relations, uh, equal employment, and we go to the UN, and I've, you know, been privileged to go to Geneva, and you make, you know, the Ministry of Justice stand there, and we give our report, and they say this, this is how they think New Zealand's going, and they will say yes or no, or whatever, and then, even though recommendations are made, it m- really means diddly squat, you know. So um, someone said to me, you know, you're like a toothless tiger when I went in there. And um, in some ways, you know, they're right. Um, but it's our role to make sure that some of, at least some of the work we did gets, gets noticed, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and it, it depends, you know, it's sort of like we're important, Sometimes, but most of the time insignificant because governments will just proceed and do whatever they like. Mm. So knowing what you know now, taking into account the baptism of fire, Mm. the death threats, the stress, you know, the good and the bad, if you had your time again, would you do it again? No. Wow. Not for, I mean, they're handsomely paid positions, you know. I mean, you know, probably overpaid, I would say, you know, to be perfectly honest. Um... Oh, well, I suppose that's a hard thing to answer, actually, because what I learnt Mm. in that role has been... um, I couldn't couldn't actually provide an explanation of how enriching it was or how mind-blowing it was. Like, But if I knew what I knew before I went into the commission and got asked to do the role, I'd probably choose to do something else where I think I could make more of an effective difference and change. Which which was a... Better feeling walking away from the, the squash or the race relations conciliator commissioner. <laughs> well, one I walked away elated; the other way I walked away defeated. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean there were lots of issues internally and externally in that role, and um, but you know I'll be walking down the street in Wellington and I'll see a survivor of historic state abuse in the street, and they'll stop me. Or just the other day, I got a little message from one of them. You know thanking me and thinking of me when it's and you know those are things and moments where you realise that what you did made a difference and mattered and it's just that personal connection you might have made. I mean I would have liked to have continued in some role in shape or form in there Um, perhaps what happened at the end you know went against me or whatever but I also think that they don't like stroppy assertive women who actually call people out particularly governments um and so yeah i mean i think that's my downside is i'm doomed to get any i don't i don't stand my lane <laughs> <laughs> don't stand my lane <laughs> well if it, you know i'm 50 i'm just gonna do what i like <laughs> but yeah i mean similarly like last year i applied for um to go on the board of sport new zealand high performance sport new zealand i thought you know unashamedly my qualifications in sport you know not only have i played um, you know i've been at grassroots got experience in governance, I've been the CEO of a sports trust, uh, you know, I've run, I've been the chairman of the Halberg Trust, I've 
I'm, I'm on, now on the board. It's a decent CV. Yeah, yeah, it's strong. Body it's, work. it's a strong CV. Club, Helen, I've got a son who's an elite in a different sport. You know, I've had two sons go to college. I'm passionate. I'm knowledgeable. I, un, you know, I'm got good governance experience. So I put my CV in. Well, my CV probably wasn't very good, actually, because it was a bit of a hurry. And I then got told that, you know, I didn't quite have the skills and expertise that they were looking for. Please tell me it wasn't an automated email. <laughs> Please tell me it was no, at least personalised. No, I think it was, well, it came from someone who I'd never heard of. But, you know, um, the fact that I not, didn't even get interviewed. Mm. Uh, and it's not that I'm saying that I am the greatest thing since sliced bread, but... Uh, if you have someone with all of this experience and particularly someone who's prepared to challenge uh, then there's a reason isn't there they just don't want you but you know so I look at all of this stuff that's come out of the reviews with cycling and you know high performance sport and you know I take Julian for example a very introverted conservative uh, diligent lovely young man you know who's had who has personally made the sacrifices and take it, done what it's take to try and qualify for the Tokyo Olympics and then the Commonwealth Games but at some stage when you're 28 unfortunately you have to get a job you know because mm. the bank of mum and dad does dry up and you've got a plan for your future but you know at the last Commonwealth Games he was told the ones before this Birmingham I don't know where they were the last time Malaysia Oh, Gold Coast. Yes, Gold Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he was in America still running, and they said if you run, I think, 355 flat for the indoor mile, you'll make selection of the teams. He ran 355.1, uh. um, which was fine. He knew he didn't yeah. qualify. Mm. And then Nicholas pulled out, and they had no one run in the history of the... Um, that was the first time in the history of the Empire and Commonwealth Games that nobody had run in the 1,500 metres uh, for New Zealand. So... You know, that's a bit of a crushing blow. Yeah. And then, you know, you go away and you do all this and you talk about mental health and wellbeing. Where's, where are the support mechanisms? You know, he's just lucky that he's got his head together and he comes from a good family and we deal with all of the... But, yeah. So I just look at all of that. We It's certainly about buying medals. You know, I mean, in some ways I just think what's the difference between my sport and those Olympic sports and whatever. I think... You know, we're very lucky because generally we're not at the whim of selectors. You know, a team might be picked, mm. but if you're a rower or a cyclist or a... You know, it's that whole thing about a few events every year and you are totally at the whim. I mean, if you qualify, even if you qualify for the times sometimes... You have to be ratified sometimes, You're still sometimes, at the whim, right? whim of selectors, aren't you? Mm. And I think we put so much into people when they've got there as opposed to once you've got there... You know, it's not our job to keep funding your your career. This is going to make me really popular. I can <laughs> just tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do you sort of understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Is, and, you know, we have determined or decided already that we are not only good, but these are the sports that we excel at, so these are the only things we're going to fund. Mm. You know, whether that be in the throwing and uh, athletics or the track cycling or, you know, the rowing or whatever, and I think it's time to revisit the whole model of high-performance sport funding, and not, and not just the funding, as we talked about, you know, whether we have centralised... Um, see, this is why I should have got on the board of high-performance yeah. sport well, I was going to say, you're, you're not a lone voice in this, because we had Eugene Barriman on, Israel Adesanya's right. um, coach, yeah. who's saying similar things, that, you know, they've got to go offshore now to represent... New Zealand at a at a global sport and they don't really get the support that they feel like they're entitled to no. or they their results entitle them to yeah yeah and I think it's just we've become a little um, I don't know whether we're narrow in our focus and the other thing is that because um, obviously I'm not deemed qualified to do all this is that we have a very small pool of sports administrators and so you know when things I mean for example the Heron report is this report that much different from the hearing report that was done three or four years ago? And yeah. you know, so um, mm. it's there's not enough athlete-led uh, initiatives in terms of you know returning it back or giving the athletes the the say or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean I'm blithering a bit, but yeah, 
you can still see that I'm very passionate about sport. Yeah, and yeah. if Grant Robertson's listening after yeah. Winston Peters, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a job. <laughs> yeah, you are. And you I are. don't even want a job. I, I mean, I'll volunteer. I would, but I say that. But, you know, now I'm sort of, um, you know, I'm 58, but I feel like I'm 21 and what am I going to do when I grow up? Because I'm just so passionate and interested about things and I like to keep up with what's changing. I can see that. And you know? so there will be someone listening who has a job for you. Ah. Guarantee it. <laughs> a project. A project. A project. project. <laughs> I'm not really into big jobs. But no, no, I just um yeah, I just think there are so many sport is so important in New Zealand. It's not the be all and end all everything, but there are so many uh, you know, firstly how do we get children involved in playing sport? Not just for um, you know, not an organised structured competitive sport. How do we get people involved and engaged and being active and you know we haven't nailed that part um, and then how do we support people as I said that not everybody can be a world champion but mm. everyone can be a champion in their own grade mm. and um, I think we're just you know missing the boat mm. and we have all these initiatives that come out they suddenly get embedded and then they'll change it then they'll throw the baby out with the bathwater and start again so. and my favorite type of guest because the first act as a world champion is worthy of a podcast on its own and so is the second so mm. is what you've done since retiring which has been incredibly impressive uh, we won't keep you for much longer but Shay's got a bunch of things to tidy us up with just a couple of rats and mice to chase up with <laughs> um, and they're sort of around your interactions with, with interesting people um, can you talk about a, a dinner with Sir Peter Blake uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and Bill Clinton yep uh, many, many 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 years ago I got invited to the APEC Leaders mm. Summit that was held here in Auckland. Um, again, you know, this is the uh, gen gender inequality. Uh, I was a dame and John didn't get invited. And I went on, I was sitting at the table with Sir Edmund Hillary and Lady Hillary and Sir Peter Blake and Lady Blake. Uh, sadly, they're no longer with us. Um, and uh, the President of Brazil and his wife, and, you know, not that I want to name drop here. It was yeah, that's no, good. And um, Clinton was, President Clinton was sitting, you know, not far f not far away from me, actually, and uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to get the chance to meet the most powerful man in the United States, you know. Uh, at least I could go home and say I'd achieved something. Um, it wasn't sort of function where you got up and said, g'day, Bill, I'm <laughs> Susie from Rota Vegas. <laughs> uh, so I looked around for um, Isaiah Beeman. I looked around for someone I knew, and I saw Isaiah Beeman. He was the... US ambassador at the time to, in New Zealand and we had met at Sir Edmund Hillary's 80th birthday and so I went over and uh, I said hello so I, I said and he said hello James Susan I said look if the opportunity presents itself I'd really like to shake the president's hand you know I was watching that people were being taken over and getting a few seconds you know and yeah. so I went over and um, Isaiah said Mr President <coughs> this is Dame Susan Devoy she is she is uh, he said, she is New Zealand's most prolific Olympic gold medalist. Oh. <laughs> well, I was so, oh, God, what do you say, you know? Yeah. Um, and I thought, and then he said, oh, really? He said, how many medals have you won? And I thought, oh, he's to told a couple, couple of great big pork pies in his life and got away with it, hasn't he? <laughs> so I just said 10, thinking that, you know, it would be over in a minute. And he looked at me rather blankly, or not blankly, quizzically, and said, oh, he must be the world's most prolific <laughs> Olympic gold medalist. By that stage, I was so embarrassed, I'd crawled on my hands and knees and gone back to the, you know, got back to my table. So, yeah, I've met a lot of... Uh, Nelson Mandela, is that on the list yeah, as I well? Yeah, I met Nelson Mandela, um, the Queen, Prince Charles, Lady Diana. You take your kids to meet no, Edmund Hillary? Would, Sir Edmund? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, you have had some great stories. Yeah. yeah. We could end with that famous story of all time about... You know, when you're um, when people are raising money, they want you to donate memorabilia or something. Well, you know, uh, it wasn't very long that I didn't have any more rackets or any frilly knickers or anything to, you know, or any squash balls to donate. So I had this idea where someone else had told me or done it that get a five dollar note and you know, Sir Edmund's on one side and I, I would autograph the five dollar note and I would get Sir Ed to autograph and then I'd put it in a little frame. And um, one day I was going around to get some more signed, and uh, this is when I lived in Auckland, and I had all the boys in the car. They were little, and I told them to stay in the car at all costs or I'd chop their legs off. And I went in, and I very quickly got, I think, 
10 or 15 signed or whatever and I came out and so Edwin followed me out with Lady Hillary and said oh are these your boys Susan you know I'd really like to meet them I was like no you don't <laughs> <laughs> and he said bring them in and so they went in and I said to the boys you know this is um, a hands behind your back place you know like you do in a china shop and we went in and it was very nice I think they had a cup of a glass of orange juice and they sat there and he had a bit of you know a few bits and bobs to show them and they talked about him um, and on the way we got we were leaving and I said now what do you say boys you know say to children thank you for having us and Julian of all of my children is going says yes, thank you for having us he said um, you must be really rich for an old fella because you've got your face in all the five dollar notes <laughs> and then my other son Son piped up, Alex, and said, yeah, and my mum said, you're fa really famous because you've climbed Mount Eden. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the mouths of babes, you know. Awesome. awesome. That's so good. That's so good. That's been such an enjoyable episode, Susan. Oh, nice. Thanks so much oh, for, yeah. for sharing no? so much of yourself and, and your journey. Shay's probably got a nice outro lined well, up. Well, I wondered if there's ever a case where people can be damed twice. One, <laughs> once for your, your sporting achievements, but also for your work that you've done in the second act of your career. Oh no, I'm more scared I'm going to get it taken off. Because <laughs> if you keep talking about my episodes at the Blue Room in uh, yeah, Arrowtown, yeah. it's li likely, unlikely that I'll ever get any more honours. Yeah. <coughs> no, um, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I mean, on occasions like this, which don't happen very often, it's quite nice to take a trip down memory lane and, you know, remember what you did do and what you were good at but also to see the communication with my family you know which is pretty awesome and uh, yeah they are certainly the joy of my life and the greatest achievement and um, yeah and that they want to hang out with their mother and their father yeah. you know so good luck with your uh, have you got family no, no no I live vicariously through him right <laughs> right right well there's a lot to Lots of positive to be said for being childless <laughs> too, yeah. I might add. Uh, thank you so much. That's been amazing. We've no loved worries. it. Catch you again soon. Cool. Yep.